when we think about typing, it's very easy to think about how to make your editor more efficient by having shortcuts and extensions, ways to customize the command line. All those are valuable. Today I'll be talking about the actual physical skill of typing and ways in which we might be able to improve it. The first is the topic of hand position, of how we position the hands. There are different diagrams that you can look up and different ideas of how to position the hands. I prefer to think of it a little differently, using lessons um, from a number of violin teachers about how to have good posture for the hand when you're playing the violin or doing anything that requires significant finger movements and uh, interactions with the fingers. So why the water bottles? An exercise I found very useful for determining a natural position for the hand is to inspect your hand after you catch a water bottle. And the reason is you don't have time to position your fingers, you don't have time to put them out of position or to contort them in some way. So if you inspect what happens when you catch something naturally and just have a reflex catch, there's a general rounding of the hand and the fingers generally go into a very natural position that you can maintain. And if you think of this position, it's similar to what you have when you are turning a door handle with your wrist. The, the basic idea that I found most helpful with determining how to position the hands is to avoid overthinking it. And if I find that I'm in a position that's awkward or uncomfortable, I recommend just stepping back and you're just uh, dropping your hands at your side and trying to re-grasp this natural position and trying to emulate it on the key. So you would position your hands on the keyboards, uh, on, on the keyboard in a way that matches the general arc of your fingers when you're not even thinking about how to position them. That's hand position. Posture is a broader topic. It deals with how you're standing, how you're sitting, how you're positioning your arms and Posture has a big influence on how efficiently you can interact with the keyboard. So one idea for thinking about how to improve posture, if you think of yourself as a marionette, a puppet controlled by strings, and you're positioning your hands on the keyboard or on the mouse, if you're, when you're controlling a puppet, you're controlling the motions of the object from above. So there's a gravitational pull above the object and it's not controlled from interior muscles, it's being dragged along. So if you think of this sort of setup, when you're typing and you're positioning your hands on the keyboard or you have to adjust, if you think of yourself as a puppet and imagine that as your hands are positioning um, on the keyboard um, or in your general operating environment, Imagine that there's a force that's pulling your arms up instead of something that you're forcing up. Because if you're, I see this quite often, if you're setting up a position and your focus is on raising the wrists or positioning the fingers in a way that, um, that reaches a particular destination, um, it forces your hands to be locked and prevents the freedom of motion that would come if, um, if there were a different visualization of simply allowing the allowing all the um, all the parts to move freely so imagining that you're being pulled from above and imagining that there's a string or there's some um, there's some object that's dragging the hand along from above maybe a useful visualization for improving posture let's talk about the actual motions of typing It happens quite often that there's a desire to improve speed, or there's a question, why is this typing going more slowly than it should? If you think about it, the fingers are fast enough. The fingers are plenty fast, and you can test this out by just drumming your fingers on a table or on a surface, because you can be very fast, because there's no friction, and it's a very natural motion. You could roll your fingers or drum the fingers on a desk all day, much to the annoyance of people around you. You could also do the same thing with your wrists. Your wrists, if you're moving your wrists or rolling, uh, um, drumming the fingers, that's something that's non-exhausting and it's very easy to continue that. Unfortunately, if you're locking the wrists or trying to, uh, or locking knuckles and then, or locking, locking the upper hand and then trying to push, there's going to be a 
dramatic reduction in the velocity of your typing. Often you can detect tension by noticing things that are moving that you're not trying to move. For example, if, you are, if you're trying to type with the index finger, the index finger might be tense, but you'll notice tension most significantly if the pinky starts moving like this. Or if, you have, if you're trying to deal with part of the hand and the rest of the hand is moving in some way. By dropping the fingers instead of pushing the keys, the power of gravity is working in your advantage and you can effect a much more sustainable pace. So as you're typing, if you detect that, uh, I've done this before, um, the temptation is to bang more firmly on the keys or to simply type harder. That's counterproductive for speed and general reliability. So think about the finger motions and um, keep in mind the image of rolling your fingers or drumming the fingers and how that can be a picture of the speed that you get when there's nothing holding you back. This is my favorite keyboard. And the reason it's my favorite is that there are no indications on the keys. You have to really know the keyboard. Using this sort of keyboard can be helpful to train your hands to type at the correct positions. Every keyboard has knobs on the F and J keys, so you can return to your home position for the, um, for the hands whenever you're typing. It's generally more productive to, for improving speed and becoming better at typing in general to focus on mastering the home position and returning to it carefully rather than looking at the keys to verify that your hands are in the correct place. You'll notice your hands are in the correct place if you know the correct position so well that deviations from it become obvious. Some additional thoughts on improving the correctness of typing. Consistency is more important than extremes. It's better to type at a fairly consistent rate than to have extremely fast periods of typing and then other periods where it's extremely slow. The goal in improving efficiency and effectiveness as one is interacting with the keyboard and just interacting with the computing environment in general is to have natural motions and to be able to move freely without worrying about, without, uh, without being unnaturally constricted. So correctness is really important, probably more important than focusing on raw speed. Also, if you've built a strong habit of correctness, you'll detect mistakes as they occur and be equipped to minimize dependence on the backspace key and improving the ability to have even strokes so that the sensation of typing is more uniform. Now, all of us spend a lot of time typing and injuries can have a significant impact. Repetitive stress injuries are quite common among software developers and there are other kinds of injuries as well that you can have just by poor positioning and sitting improperly or just working for long periods of time without natural movement. I'm by no means an expert on dealing with injuries and some of them are quite serious. You know, some people have focal dystonia or some sort of involuntary muscle spasms that they can't, um, can't is easily address. So this is not, I don't necessarily have strong advice for extreme cases. What I can say is it's important to pay attention to the warnings that your body is giving you. So if you notice that there's pain or tension or lack of relaxation, it's important to stop and pay attention to what has changed or what structure needs to be improved in order to avoid that sensation. Pain might be a useful thing when you're trying to build physical stamina. Not that I would know much about that. But uh, injuries and typing are, uh, are a serious thing. So if there is pain, don't type through the pain. Stop and figure out what's going on. Now all these things combined lead to speed. Eliminate the causes of inconsistency and slowness and speed is a natural byproduct. Don't focus on speed, focus on becoming comfortable with the keyboard and eliminating everything that slows you down. Now these are some high level concepts for interaction with the keyboard and they apply broadly even if you're not using Vim. There are some thoughts about 
configurations on the keyboard on the on the computer itself. The Mac OS and um, and other operating systems don't ship with optimal settings. So there are a few things that I found very helpful and maybe useful to you as well. In the keyboard settings, you can set the key repeat and the delay until repeat. If you set them to the most extreme setting, there are a couple of things that will happen. First, you'll find that uh, your, your, your typing is not as even and uniform as you thought, and it'll force you to have extremely short motions. So if you, if you like that sort of challenge, that's a, that's a setting I recommend. Another setting that's very useful, and I don't know why it's not the default. If you go to the keyboard shortcuts tab in System Preferences, there's an option to allow keyboard access to text boxes and lists only or for all controls. And if you don't enable it for all controls, you won't be able to tab through uh, command buttons and basically the only keyboard interaction you'll have in modal dialogues, like this one, will be to press enter to, um, to click OK. Everything else will require the mouse. So definitely use the, um, use the full keyboard access if you want to avoid the mouse. And I trust that uh, this is not news, but useful, um, useful for reference. You can also map the caps lock key to control system-wide. Um, the, the Mac has a setting under keyboard preferences to allow you to make that setting even if you're not um, across the entire system. So it doesn't have to be in the in the Vim configuration or in Tmux or um, configuration for a specific application. Dealing with apps is another challenge because we're all using extremely capable windowed machines and I think there's power of that. There's also a disadvantage. I think command tab is a distraction. Command tab forces you to consider the applications that are currently running. It's causes anxiety, as you notice, notification bubbles with ever-increasing numbers. And it also forces you to think of your application as a set of objects that you can access in linear time. So you think of this as a hash. Sorry, this is an array. So if you think of this, this is an array. And if you want to go to the very next program, it's very easy. It's just one, one tab of command tab. But if you, say if you've switched between five applications, you've been in the You've been in your terminal, and then you switched to the browser, and then you switched back to um, some other application, and you need to get back to a program that you used earlier. You'll have to manually hold, you'll have to hold down Command Tab and switch back to the application. So that's very inefficient. A better way to close, to hide the current application is to use Command H. Command H will hide the current app and return the focus to the previously focused application. Now, how do you avoid Command Tab? Well, you can use a launcher, you can use Spotlight, or you can use Alfred, and I might be a little extreme with this, but Alfred allows you to press command space, or a shortcut, and then um, with, with training, which doesn't take very long, it's, it's optimized so it, it learns your most common applications very quickly, you can extremely quickly get to the point where, for most applications, it's just command space and then a single character. So command H, uh, command space, and then I for iTerm, command space, and then M for mail, command space S for Safari, command space SL for Slack, so on. And it also does substring matching. So you could do, if you have a lot of applications that have similar names, you could search by, uh, perform fuzzy finding based on the name. So I use command, uh, command space with Alfred for almost all task switching. And the benefit is that I don't have to think about the applications that are running. I can think about the next thing to do. I think that's very helpful for building and maintaining a sense of flow because you have, so you're writing tests, you're working with iTerm and Tmux, and then you have to switch to the iOS application or switch to the client. You can easily switch to a simulator or to Xcode or whatever other application you need. So switching from linear time or from, from linear access to constant time access is extremely helpful. Another one is a window manager. If you're dealing with multiple applications and you want to, for example, position two windows side by side, there are some improvements for that in the latest version of the Mac OS, also Windows. Um, for the last few releases has had a simple way to position two windows side by side. But for more, neither of those work very well with the keyboard and Divi or other applications allow for much, much greater customization. So I typically have two windows side by side. I'll have one, half of the screen for um, a browser, half the screen for terminal and text editor. I find that works pretty well. 
Another benefit of combining Divi and Tmux is, so you have a, you have a window in one application, and so you might have an example like Evernote. Evernote takes up one half of the screen if you're using a 13-inch MacBook. But if you double tap on a note, you can open it in a smaller window and have it positioned to fill up half the screen. So we have a window in Evernote taking up half the screen and then a, a browser or something else in the other, uh, for the other half. If you use command tab, it would switch the focus to the entire application. So Evernote would cover up whatever other application you had. Um, Divi returns the focus to the last focused window in the application. So you can easily use for example, you can use uh, Divi to switch between Evernote and Safari or some other application um, without causing the Chrome of one to be covered by the other. So I found that to be extremely useful. We've talked about general ways to deal with a computer, um, the, the typing experience, and also some ideas about specific applications. Now, for the development experience itself, I think we want to be on the left side of this as much as possible. And there are lots of mistakes that we'll make and many things to discover. If we can eliminate unnecessary friction, I think we can be closer to a state of knowing exactly what we want to make and interacting directly with the code rather than with unnecessary artifacts of windowing systems and having to switch between applications. Also, a very common manifestation of discomfort with typing is that avoiding typing becomes really common. So if we can make typing fast, maybe we won't be tempted to use single variable, uh, single character variable names because there's no cost to typing. It's, it's very fast. There are many arguments why you shouldn't do that anyway, but that's, <laughs> that's at least, that's another one. Uh, in addition to that, copying and pasting code, if you are, if your typing is, ex is extremely fast and you can basically, it's not, a, it's not a burden or a barrier to programming, Maybe being better at typing, having more comfort with the environment, will reduce the amount of pasting. I think that's a benefit um, for, for the quality of software and for understanding of it in general. So I think discomfort with type is learned helplessness, uh, learned helplessness and we can counteract that by employing some of these techniques here. So in summary, I hope that you'll have some ideas for improving your typing experience. and. As, as you observe your typing, just make sure not to push. Remember, pushing buttons causes way too much tension. It's much better to drop the fingers. Also, the, the combination of all these tiny behaviors and practices can have a significant impact in the overall experience and even sustainability of working with computing systems. Thank you. Any questions or do we have, we're going to the questions or anything? Um you're talking about remapping the caps lock and also the control. Yes. The, the caps lock to control. What I like there's someone else that came in that was using Emacs, I believe. They're not interview that like did that, but what's like the biggest benefit of doing that? So in Emacs, many options are controlled by the control key. So caps lock doesn't really have a purpose anymore. There's not really much of a use for it. Um, it, it comes back from a legacy of, of typewriters, really. So the, the caps lock key is a key that's very easy to remap because it's not used very much. Um, so remapping it to control makes it easier to use for, for Emacs. Also in Vim, if you use control and left bracket, that's equivalent to escape. Um, so very convenient. Um, to avoid, basically to avoid having to use the escape key, which forces your hand out of position. Um, and there are many other reasons as well. Um, I'm sure others here would have would be more equipped to answer that. Um, I don't really, my, my customization has sort of, uh, I've, I've reduced that. So now I have a more minimal setup. Use a few plugins, a few, um, few customizations. Um, but control back, uh, control left bracket uh, for escape is, uh, is very useful in Vim. Another one. Control tab in the browser, control A for beginning of time. There are many, many uses for control. Yeah. And I can't think of anyone for the past. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
on the uh, on the Mac, on the Mac, you can also use so um, a lot of apps that have so on Windows you might have a control tab. Um, on the Mac, a very common equivalent is Command Shift Left Bracket or Right Bracket. Uh, so I find myself often using that for like, switching tabs in browsers or doing, uh, different applications. So did you have a did you have a question? There's also, you can, um, is it Carabiner? If you use a Mac Carabiner or something you can use, then you can change it so that if you just hit a caps lock, it's going to be in the escape. Yeah. Mm. If you hit it with something, it'll be control, so you can kind of use that for, yeah. for two things. It's a pretty neat thing. Um, it's new. Steve Wash or something has a, has a description of it. So, uh, Interesting. Yeah, it's, it's pretty it's extremely helpful for them. Just left pinky instead of any weird escape or bracket. It's just hmm. it's right there. Do you have any uh, like suggestions for improving correctness, like not relying on tab for obviously like improving correctness as you're typing? It's like a lot of times when I'm typing, I'll just like I want to like just obviously I want to when I'm using even if I'm using uh, just a bit of plugin. Yeah. Um, but like, do you have any thoughts on correctness? Because based on your experience with Python, is there any uh, practice? So I think I think autocomplete is overdone in general, but I know it's very useful, and I, I use it to. Um, I think the what I try to do to improve correctness for the most part is also a technique from just practicing music. When you make a mistake, you stop and correct it, and if you make mistakes and correct them and make the same mistake and correct it again, you've trained yourself to make the mistake. You haven't actually improved. Because what you're doing is you're reinforcing the incorrect, um, the incorrect result and then relying on backspace or relying on corrections. So uh, I think noticing patterns in incorrectness and um, I think really slowing down. The, if you slow down and do things correctly, it's amazing how much faster you'll go. It's, it's, there's really a, I don't know if that's particularly helpful, but those are yeah, just yeah. slowing down and. Um, the hardest part for like me is like I, I thought I want to get out. I, like if I get frustrated and I keep going back and I'm not in practice mode, like I'm just like just trying to, to get um, something written. It can be tough. So yeah. I'm just curious. Like do you set aside time to do that and separate from uh, like in the morning, like half an hour every day? Is that the way to do it, or is it something you should think about all the time? <laughs> I find that it helps to write quite a bit. So just so writing significantly on the computer, is, uh, just typing off a lot. I do type quite a bit, but um, that's mostly is, um, because that's my choice. But I, I, don't, I don't I don't allocate specific time to uh, to practice typing now. I did at one point, not not right now. For completion, there's a talk that's called "Let Me Do the Typing" of George Brockenhorst, who worked. Two here, which you might find interesting. Okay, so that's tricks for completing the lines and doing variables, completing different things. You might need to set things to the second. Thank you, Paul. Thank you.